Kyoto. Once the capital of Japan is home to 17 world cultural heritage sites and has long been a favourite destination for tourists, expats and backpackers from all over the globe. Famous for its stunning ancient temples like the Golden Kinkakuji and the magical Kiyomezodela, it is also world-renowned for its charming, winding streets and serene gardens. As the cultural heart of Japan, Kyoto is the last place anyone would expect a mass murder to occur. However, on a humid, overcast morning, on the 18th of July 2019, one man's quest for revenge over a perceived act of plagiarism would shock the world and take the lives of 36 people, causing serious injuries to a further 34, making it the deadliest attack on Japanese soil since the end of the Second World War. With the likes of Studio Ghibli's Spirited Away and My Neighbor Totoro, as well as many other cult favourites, such as Sailor Moon and Gundam, anime is a $2 billion industry and has long been a key aspect of Japanese culture, enjoyed by children and adults alike from all over the world. Kyoto Animation, known as KyoAni to its scores of loyal fans, started life as a small and humble animation studio, first established in 1981 by charismatic husband and wife team Hideaki and Yoko Hatta. The Hattas began their studio by recruiting unemployed mothers and other inexperienced workers who would ordinarily not be given a chance. Yoko Hatta, talking to a journalist at the time, stated women have an innate power of being kind and gentle. So, we hire more female staff, because we also want our animation to be filled with that heartwarming power. This kind of sentiment alone made Kyoani stand out from the crowd, and immediately won the hearts of so many within the anime community. In the following years, the studio grew in size, and gained widespread popularity across Japan for its production of high-quality anime movies, and for its skills in storytelling, producing over 28 television shows and films between the years 2003 and 2019. Many of the studio's productions became instant classics, such as the series The Melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya, an animation series about the adventures of a supernatural high school girl, Clannard, a fantasy drama, and k a series following the lives of four high school girls. The studio was a creative's dream workplace as well, and positions there were highly sought after by other artists and writers alike, not only for the chance to work at a successful and popular studio, but also due to the fact that Hideaki and Yoko were very kind employers, with a vision to support artists fully. They paid a generous full-time salary to staff where other animation studios tended to only pay artists and writers on a freelance basis. They also offered an array of training opportunities within the studio, as both Yoko and Hideaki believed from the beginning in fostering artistic talent wherever they found it. One way in which the studio discovered new talent and up-and-coming artists was by running the annual Animation Awards competition, a yearly cash prize contest open to professional and amateur writers alike, and offering the chance for lucky winners to have their stories published and adopted by the studio. Unbeknownst to Hideaki and Yokohata and others at Kyoani, it would be this same competition that would spark a hatred so deep in one man and flame his obsession with revenge, culminating in one appalling act of violence. The morning of Thursday the 18th of July started pretty typically for the employees of the Kiyoani Studio One building. The day, though overcast, was already growing humid, and the cicadas could be heard buzzing continuously in the trees jotted along the roads leading to the busy Rokujizo train station in the residential area of Fushimi, where Studio One was located. From the outside, Studio One, the animation company's main base of operations, was just an ordinary-looking, old-fashioned and simple three-storey building connected by a single iron spiral staircase. But the inside was very much different. The interior had a buzzing but very relaxed and creative atmosphere. Tatami mats were laid out on the floors, as is Japanese custom in the home. Employees walked around barefoot or in slippers. 
There was even a space in the corner of the second floor for taking a nap if artists wanted to catch up on sleep after lunch. The Hatters always wanted their company to have a family feeling to it, and Studio One was a testament to that. Around 70 artists, writers and animators were gearing up for another hectic day of creating, whilst chatting and laughing about their plans for the weekend. Amongst them was 22-year-old Yuka Kasama and 23-year-old illustrator Yuki Amura, who had both only just recently joined the studio after graduating from university. Yuka's mother would later say about her daughter that her dream since she was a young child was to go into the animation industry. At around 10.30am, a dishevelled and heavy-set man wearing spectacles, a sweat-stained red t-shirt and dirty stonewashed jeans burst through the front doors of the studio, carrying a 40-litre liquid container and shouting, die, die, die. The man then began frantically splashing gasoline around the entrance, hallway and over shocked studio employees who attempted to stop him. A desperate struggle ensued, but the man pulled out a lighter and ignited the fuel, causing what many witnesses recalled as a large flash and explosion. A middle-aged man who was working at a housing exhibition near the studio at the time told reporters after, I was in the office around 10.30 and suddenly I heard an explosion. When I went outside, I heard another large explosion. I could see there were flames and smoke mainly on the second and third floors of the studio and some people were evacuating. The smoke was rising quickly and it was really thick, so I immediately called the fire department. Engulfed in flames, the culprit fled screaming from the building where he was pursued by two studio employees and, with the aid of police officers later, he was wrestled to the ground in a courtyard around 100 metres away. As the badly burnt man struggled with police, he repetitively shouted, They plagiarised my work, I did it because they stole my novel. And he demanded to speak to the president of the studio. Police restrained the man who had severe burns on his legs, chest and face until backup arrived. Officers also discovered knives and bladed weapons concealed in a bag near the studio that belonged to him too. Due to the very common occurrence of earthquakes in Japan, the vast majority of smaller buildings, such as the three-storey Kyoto Animation Studio One building, are constructed with wooden frames, which can cause fires to spread with chilling ease, heartbreakingly. This would also prove to be the case with KyoAni, which, due to its designation as a small business building, also lacked sprinklers and fire extinguishers throughout its premises. The flame spread and grew ferociously within seconds, trapping most of the terrified employees, including Yuka and Yuki, inside the building and forcing them up the single spiral staircase to the smoke-engulfed second and third floors, where many of them collapsed due to suffocation or succumbed to the flames and died. A deadly arson attack at an animation studio in Japan has proven devastating. At least 33 people are feared dead and dozens more were injured in the attack. Rescue operations are still ongoing. A man was reportedly seen spraying gasoline around the building before it was quickly engulfed by flames. We found two people on the ground floor, 11 on the second floor, 22 on the staircase from the third floor to the roof. This is so outrageous hearing this was caused by arson regardless what the motive motivation could have been. I feel anger towards the suspect. The suspect was injured in the fire and is now in hospital. It's not clear what his motive was, but one witness overheard him complaining that the studio had stolen his work. He seemed to be in pain, irritated and suffering, but also angry as if he was resentful. I heard him saying something like, you copied it. Firefighters would later state, that the fire had grown to the unbelievable temperature of 957 degrees Fahrenheit. Bystanders on the street outside could only watch helplessly, in horror, as screams and shouts drifted from the building, which was now submerged in smoke. The extreme heat and toxic fumes drove many of them back as they desperately awaited for the fire brigade to arrive on scene. 81-year-old Ken Okamura, who lived close to the studio, told reporters the next day, that he saw several women jump from the burning building's second floor. They were so badly burned that blood was coming from their noses, and all of their clothes, but their underwear, were gone, he said. Another witness was 74-year-old Hatsumi Yamashita, who taught dance at the local community centre, where many of the injured were brought to receive immediate emergency treatment. The dance teacher told reporters she thought one of the girls was wearing a jet-black outfit. 
However, when she looked closer, she realised to her horror that when the girl lay down on the floor, she was so burned that she was almost naked. I could never forget this young woman, Miss Yamashita said. On this tragic morning, the studio president Hideaki wasn't at Studio One. He had been preparing for an interview with a major Japanese television channel about some animation work that they had created for the 2020 Tokyo Summer Paralympics across the city at Studio 5. It was just as the interview was coming to a close at around 10.33 that he received a call from one of his employees informing him that there was a fire at Studio One. He later stated he wasn't overly concerned at the time. The member of staff who had called him didn't seem alarmed and Hideaki wrongly assumed one of the animators had set off a fire alarm or that there had been a small confined fire in the staff kitchen. He brushed off the call and continued his morning as usual, making preparations for an early afternoon business meeting at Studio One, telling himself he would find out soon enough what had been the cause of the telephone call. It would only be a short while later as he was driving towards Studio One that he noticed the thick black smoke and heard the wailing sirens. He began to worry. He called his wife Yoko on her cell phone. He knew she wasn't scheduled to be at Studio One that day, but was relieved to know that she was safe, though she also didn't know what was happening. Unable to progress further in his car due to the firefighters blocking off the streets, the 69-year-old CEO parked quickly on a side street and ran towards the billowing clouds of smoke and the studio that he and his wife had dedicated their entire lives to building up. As soon as he got to the scene and saw the scale of the fire, he knew there was nothing he could do. He stumbled upon a small group of his employees sprawled out on the ground in an alley, coughing and crying, their clothes and skin black with smoke. He asked them what had happened, and when no one could really answer, he fell to his knees and embraced them. He would spend the rest of the day at the scene, unwilling to leave, trying to help and console his surviving employees in any way that he could, trying to understand what had happened. For the husband and wife team of Hideaki and Yoko Hata, life and their beloved studio would never be the same again. The death toll from an arson attack at an animation studio in Japan has climbed to 33. As Asia correspondent Rene Henry explains, it's the country's worst mass murder in almost two decades. Most bodies were found on the stairs to the top floor, employees seemingly collapsing as they tried to escape to the roof. Firefighters smashed windows to pull the injured to safety. The 41-year-old suspect also collapsed, but found alive not far from the Kyoto Animation Studio, accused of breaking into the building, dousing it in petrol and setting it alight while 70 people were inside. Neighbours hearing him scream, drop dead, you copied it. The fire would rage for five hours until 30 fire engines and countless brave firefighters managed to get the blaze under control and then finally extinguish it at approximately 6.20am the following morning. The atrocity would instantly claim the lives of 34 people, 20 of them women and 14 of them men, with two more victims later dying in hospital from their injuries. Tragically, the firefighters would discover many of the dead on the spiral staircase leading up to the roof. Their bodies so badly burned they could only be identified by DNA testing. In the coming days, all that would remain of Kyoto Animation Studio One building was a charred and destroyed shell. Piles of flowers gathered at the site by the hour, and it would remain a shrine to the dead until it was formally demolished on the 28th of April, 2020. The demolition activity at a Kyoto Animation Studio was finally completed after months of major labor. People across Japan and the world were heartbroken and disgusted by this attack. Every person who heard the awful news had two simple questions. Who would do something like this? And why? In 2019, 41-year-old Shinji Aoba had been out of prison for three years after a six-year sentence for robbing a convenience store with a kitchen knife in 2012 and was now living in a single occupancy apartment in a suburban area just outside of the north of Tokyo and over a seven-hour drive from Kyoto. Always a deeply troubled individual, Alba had grown increasingly isolated and volatile since the death of his father from suicide in 2009. He had cut off all contact with his family and fought with his neighbours, 
and had previously received warnings from police for stealing a woman's underwear from her washing line and for making threats to people living in and around the same single occupancy building he resided in. People often saw him skulking around the neighbourhood late at night on his bicycle, always unwashed and always wearing the same clothes. Most avoided him as much as possible. In the days following the arson massacre, a neighbour living on the floor above Albers told reporters anonymously that he was relaxing in his apartment a few weeks before the attack, when he heard a furious banging from the outside and someone trying to get into his home. When the neighbour tentatively opened the front door, a dishevelled and sweating man he recognised as the troubled Alba was standing there. When the neighbour asked what he wanted, Alba attacked him, shouting, I will kill you. The attack was completely unprovoked, and the shocked and frightened neighbour quickly locked himself in the apartment and later reported it to the police. It was just one of many such incidences reported to the local police in the months and weeks leading up to the massacre. A 37-year-old woman who lived across the street from Alba's building later stated to journalists that she frequently saw the police and ambulance crews attending disturbances at his apartment, where loud music was often played through open windows to the annoyance of many. It seemed to everyone who had witnessed Alba's behaviour that he was very unstable and could be violently triggered by the smallest of things. It would only be a matter of time before something pushed him over the edge completely. Unbeknownst to everybody, Alba's fuse had been lit the year previously. On November 18th, 2018, Alba was sat in his apartment watching anime, which he now did with the majority of his time. He didn't have any friends or hobbies, and anime and video games had become his only remaining connections to society, people and real life. On this day in particular, he was watching the fifth episode of the popular KyoAni series, named Tsurune an animation about a group of high school boys in the archery club trying to make it to the national tournament, whilst also overcoming other life problems. This episode would infuriate Alba, sending him into a dark and bitter rage. In the episode of Surane, there was a brief scene where the anime's protagonists buy meat that is discounted because it is past its sell-by date. Alba glared at the television, unable to believe what he was watching. He had written the same exact scene where a protagonist buys discounted meat that is past its sell-by date, and he had written it in a novel he'd submitted to KyoAni's annual animation awards competition in the years previously. The fact that the coincidental scene was a very minor and completely inconsequential one was utterly lost on Alba. He became fixated on the idea that KyoAni had rejected his submission and then they had stolen his idea, plagiarising his work and ripping off his novel. Alba became obsessed. It was in this same period of time that the studio received a deluge of anonymous death threats by email that numbered in the hundreds, and the police had been called in to patrol the main studios for a brief time. The emails could never be tracked down by the authorities due to the author using a particular software that blocked all tracing attempts. The police patrols gradually decreased as the death threats ceased. It would only be after the massacre and apprehension of the killer that the death threats in Alba would be linked, though not ever concretely proven. Four days before the Studio One massacre, a 27-year-old company employee, who later gave his name to the media simply as Matsumoto, was lying on the sofa in his apartment watching a sports live stream on YouTube, when the person in the apartment above his started banging on the floor. Assuming the upstairs neighbour was assembling furniture or rearranging their apartment, Matsumoto simply turned up the volume on his sports game and tried to ignore the noise. However, it was only moments later that the neighbour in the apartment next to his started violently thumping on the wall. This caused a chill to run down his spine, as the neighbour now seemingly attacking the shared wall was the neighbour from hell, Shinji Alba. Matsumoto had been living next door to Alba for a couple of years and was scared of him, stating he always was noisy, dirty and rude, as well as being known for violence. He said, he smelled terrible, really, really bad. I'm sure restaurants wouldn't let him in because of the way he smelled. When Alba started beating on his front door, Matsumoto attempted to ignore it. But when Alba returned to his apartment and started throwing objects against the wall, Matsumoto decided to try and talk to him. He went outside into the corridor and knocked on Alba's front door. When there was no answer, he shouted through the letterbox that it wasn't him making all the loud noises, but an upstairs neighbour, 
The door suddenly opened and out came Alba, grabbing the younger, smaller man by the throat and hair, shouting, You're too loud, shut up, I'm going to kill you. When Matsumoto again tried to explain to the enraged Alba that the noises hadn't come from his apartment, but the one upstairs, Alba screamed in his face, It's irrelevant, you're annoying, I'll kill you, I have nothing to lose. Shaken, Matsumoto fled the building to the nearest police station to report the incident, but when police finally arrived at Alba's apartment to talk to him, he had seemingly gone missing. Matsumoto would later go on to state that Alba's eyes had looked, quote, insane that night. The following day, Alba was witnessed riding the high-speed bullet train from Saitama to Kyoto, where he checked into a cheap motel in a downtown area situated close to many popular tourist destinations and night spots. In the days leading up to the mass murder, still wearing the same bright red t-shirt and stonewashed jeans, he had been wearing the night of the confrontation with his neighbour Matsumoto. Alba was witnessed by locals and captured on CCTV numerous times in the proximity of the Studio One building. On Wednesday, the day before the attack, Alba strolled into a hardware store and purchased a four-wheeled push trolley. That afternoon, he pushed the trolley over six miles to a gas station, where he filled up two red plastic containers with over 10 gallons of gasoline. He then loaded the containers onto the trolley, paid for the gas, and wheeled the trolley towards a disused and abandoned child's play area, situated underneath a motorway underpass. It was here, in this lonely and deserted area, that he concealed the gas containers that he would use in the appalling attack the very next day, a day that would change the lives of everyone involved, and change Japan forever. Confusion was rife in the hours and days following the attack, Friends and family tried desperately to reach loved ones who worked in the Studio One building. Authorities published lists of survivors and staff members who had been taken to nearby hospitals, and many family members were left bereft when they couldn't find the names of their loved ones on the hospital admissions or on the lists released to the media. 69-year-old Kazuo Akada, whose granddaughter Megumi Ono worked in Studio One and who hadn't been accounted for, told television reporters on the day of the fire that Megumi was my pride. Her name started appearing on the screens of anime movies. I was so happy to see that. I was proud of her. I want to see her face soon. It wouldn't be until over a week later that 21-year-old Megumi's fate would be conclusively determined through DNA analysis. Tragically, she had been another victim. One week after the tragic arson fire at Kyoto Animation, police have identified all 34 of the people killed. 15 of the 34 injured are still hospitalized. As Japan mourned, new laws were passed making it more difficult to purchase large amounts of gasoline in plastic containers, and buyers now have to give their full details and an explanation for the purchase, which is all kept on record. Kind fans and supporters from across Japan and the rest of the globe came together making charitable donations to a GoFundMe for the studio, raising over $2.3 million for the victims and their families. A large majority of survivors returned to work as soon as they were able to, going back to the jobs they loved, continuing to create the animation that brought so much joy to so many people and honouring the memories of their friends and co-workers who had passed away. Upon hearing that the motive for the mass murder was revenge over a perceived act of plagiarism, the Hatters and staff members went back over past competition entries and did in fact find a submission from Alba, but it in no way resembled the scene that sent him over the edge and had no similarities whatsoever to any scenes from any of the other studio's many works. Following the attack, he was taken by police guard to the intensive care unit at the hospital. He continuously admitted to setting the blaze as an act of revenge, telling the detectives, I targeted the number one studio, where the largest number of people were working, because I wanted to hurt many people. I lit the fire because Kiyoani stole my novel. <laughs> He also told police and hospital staff that he expected to get the death penalty. Suffering from severe burns to most of his body, he soon lost the ability to speak 
and could only breathe with the aid of a respirator. He also received multiple skin grafts, and police waited until he was healthy enough to be arrested and charged. That day finally came, on the 27th of May 2020. Almost a year after the attack, Alba was still recovering in a Kyoto hospital from experimental artificial skin grafts, but he was judged fit enough to be finally arrested on suspicion of murder and arson. Begin with the latest on the arson attack in Japan, where police have now officially arrested the man suspected of killing 34 people in a famous animation studio in Kyoto. They say the 41-year-old was also once convicted of stealing from a shop. Japan's public broadcaster says he went on to the he went to the animation studio on Thursday, poured fuel, and shouted "die" as he set the building on fire. The attack was Japan's worst mass killing in 18 years. About 70 people were working in that studio when the fire broke out. He was officially indicted on the 16th of December 2020. It is highly likely he will spend the rest of his life in prison and escape the death penalty. Terawaki Yuzuru lost his wife, Terawaki Shoko, who is an animation director working for the company. So many mothers, daughters, fathers and sons were stolen in the cruelest of ways from their loved ones on that awful summer day in July 2019. However, their creativity, love, hope and talent will never be forgotten and will live on in their animation work forever. Thank you all for tuning in and we hope you found this video interesting. If you'd like to support our channel and help us to continue to make content, please don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe. It helps us so much and we really appreciate it.